Okay, I guess we can begin. I'm Manju Parikh and I teach in political science and I'm here to welcome you all for the second Global Awareness Lecture Series for spring semester. Tonight we have two very well-known and highly respected professors from New Delhi, India. They've really traveled quite a long way to give this lecture. So let me introduce them. Uh, Dr. Anuradha Chinoy is a professor in the School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, India. She's been chair and director of the Area Studies Program for Russia and Central Asia. She's a prolific scholar. Among her books are Militarization and Women in South Asia, The Making of a New Russia, and she has edited several books and penned many scholarly articles. She has been an activist and engaged in several social movements and is closely linked to many civil society organizations. She was a Fulbright scholar to United States in 1985, and she is a regular media commentator and an advisor to UNESCO on women in conflict. Uh, our other speaker is Dr. Kamal Mitra Chinoy, is a professor and chair of the Center of Comparative Politics and Political Theory at School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He's a member of the Indian Council on Social Research. He's a founder member of the Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace and a founder member of the Pakistan-India Forum for Peace and Democracy. Uh, as well as a human rights activist. Professor Chinoy taught earlier at Columbia University as a visiting scholar and at Indira Gandhi National Open University. He writes extensively in Indian and foreign journals and again is a regular commentator in print and electronic media. He's been, he has been invited frequently to speak on minority and human rights issues in many international forums, including recently in the U. EU Commission on the Question of Kurds. Tonight, the title of their presentation is India's Challenges, Maoist Insurgency and Kashmir. And I thought of this title based on their book, which they have just brought out last year. For the last several years, American media has been presenting India as an emerging economic power and a regional superpower. However, while India's economic achievements in this globalized world economic system may be praiseworthy, what we do not hear about are the costs of this success story. India also faces several internal challenges because the fruits of its growth are not being shared. Our speakers today are experts on these aspects. Please join me in welcoming professors Anuradha Mitra Chinoy and Kamal Mitra Chinoy. Whoever wants to go, you want to go first. Do you want me to just leave this? Ma, this one? Okay, sorry. Oh, I should turn. Yeah, there we go. Good evening. You have such a beautiful campus that I don't know why anyone would spend it indoors at this time of the evening. Now, what I'm going to deal with are problems in India which really affect uh, democracy and the state. The first issue is an old issue of Kashmir. And Kashmir is linked to the formation of India as a state. That is, it was decided after negotiations with British uh, who were ruling uh, that the Muslim areas would go to Pakistan and the Hindu areas would stay with India. Now, Kashmir happens to be a largely Muslim area. And therefore, there was division inside Kashmir, but they had a charismatic leader in Sheikh Abdullah and he was able to convince his followers that they should stay on in India if they got enough powers. So there was an extraordinary provision in the Indian Constitution in 1950, 
which was called Article 370. Now, Article 370 is only the number of the article in the Constitution. But 370 basically stated that Kashmir would have virtually all powers excepting defense, foreign affairs, and communication. Now, over time, over the next couple of years, India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, got a bit nervous because he felt that if Kashmir um, continued to have these powers, then other states would also want powers like Kashmir. Uh, one, sh uh, one should remember, if you look at the Indian Constitution, that the Indian Constitution is not a normal federal constitution. It is a pretty centralized constitution. So, for example, the word federal is not there in the Indian Constitution, or the word federalism. Though the union of states is there, but it doesn't connote the same thing. Now, what have, the way this taking away of power and taking back Article 370 was done was through rigged elections. And uh, through these rigged or tampered with elections, uh, people who were not really electable would be elected, but they would be dependent on Delhi, that is on the power center, for support. And they in turn would give up powers under Article 370 to please Delhi. And through this process, this happened. Of course, when you have regimes which are not answerable, then there are other problems also, like corruption, graft, uh, lack of development, uh, and all of these uh, occurred in Kashmir. Then uh, they had an election in 1987, which even by Kashmiri standards was quite extraordinary. Um, polling agents and, and uh, candidates were thrown out of the polling premises. Uh, ballot boxes were stuffed with ballots of people who should have lost. And uh, so the elections were completely rigged. Um, one of the um, PS candidates who lost, technically lost, but he uh, certainly won, Sayyid Salahuddin, he later became the head uh, of the United Jihadi Council, that is the United uh, Muslim Resistance uh, in Kashmir. Another candidate who uh, was actually a counting agent um, was uh, thrown out into the street. And he later became a militant leader of the militant groups. So um, you had a situation which had become destabilized. But the Kashmiris thought they had taken enough from the Indian state. So they went across the border to the eagerly awaiting Pakistanis. And they were trained in arms. And apart from arm training, they were given fairly heavy uh, machinery, the odd light machine gun, otherwise assault rifles, grenade launchers, grenades, etc. And with this training, they came back in 88, 89 and took on the Indian Army. This lasted till about um, 1990, but it was the first major insurgency in India to shake uh, India on terms of its, of its constitution and its promises to the people. Now, since then, there has been mass alienation in the valley. People are not always fighting or th throwing stones, but they are opposed. And what you see is, in, in this map, is what is called the line of control. Now, the line of control is not an official border. It is literally that. Area seized and controlled by the respective militaries. 
And of course, uh, China comes in because um, they had interest in making a road and all of that. So that area, K2 is the second highest mountain in the world, next to Everest. And then there's this the idea given to China by Pakistan, disputed by India. So this is not really a conflict only about India and uh, Pakistan. There are other players involved also. But um, the important thing is that this mass alienation increased. Now, um, to give you just some instances, uh, for example, when Bill Clinton came to India, there were 35 Sikhs, these are the Indians who wear turbans, were killed, allegedly by militants. Uh, but there are groups who have gone there who said that actually they've been killed by the Indian Army. Incidentally, I did a, a human rights report myself on this, and I spoke to 35 of the Sikhs in the village, and they said, no, it was militants who had killed them. But that is, things are murky in uh, Kashmir. Like I think any war zone area, depending on what your opinions are, your estimation of an event depends on those opinions. And uh, in Kashmir, uh, for example, just to take two instances, the first was when 22 uh, children were killed, children and a woman. They were throwing stones at the police. Now, uh, the internal police manual says that if you fire, you should fire below the waist. So there'll be less chance of a fatality. But here, school children were, were shot in the chest. And in fact, the youngest one, Tufel Mattu, was still carrying his police, uh, his uh, the school bag when he was shot. So this raised a hue and cry in the valley. The most recent development is that the State Human Rights Commission, which is a mandated body under the Constitution, it asked that uh, uh, unmarked graves should be uh, uncovered. And um, in preliminary results, because there was, the area was snowbound, it was estimated that there were 2,100 bodies in the unmarked grave. <clears throat> so the situation in Kashmir is obviously an abnormal situation. There has really been no attempt by Pakistan or India to really sit with the Kashmiris and make and sort out a solution. I must of course point out, um, no, no, this is not fully clear, This area is Jammu, is part of Kashmir. Now, Jammu is much less pro uh, Pakistan than Kashmir. And further on the right, right hand side, there is Ladakh, which is uh, a cold desert, something like Tibet. And they don't want to have anything to do with the Kashmiris. So it's not that it's just, it's a, it's a problem of Kashmir. It's a complex problem where one state, or one part of the state, Kashmir, is seen by other parts as getting all the benefits. Because since Kashmir is the most influential part, it is seen as getting the bulk of these revenues from the union government, usually called the center. This shows even in the picturesque uh, stupas and monuments in uh, Ladakh, in the Buddhist shrines, because most of them are funded by foreign donations. There's not much funding from the state. So now you have a multiple problem. 
You have a problem between India and Kashmir. You have a problem between Kashmir, Ladakh, and Jammu. And of course, you have a problem between India and Pakistan. And India is sitting pretty, buying arms, uh, confident in its ability to, uh, to uh, reject any approach which is different by force of arms. And that is really the core of the Kashmir problem, that people are not talking. They're talking about talking, but they're not talking. And uh, therefore, you have a situation with, where nothing in, uh, soluble is being done, and it seems, that it, it seems that it's insoluble. Now, I don't think that is the case. I, I think... Um, that there is a possibility of going back to Article 370. And uh, the Kashmiris would accept it. The Pakistanis wouldn't. But the Kashmiris would accept it. And also with that, stopping the deforestation on commercial grounds, which the Indian Army is doing, and other, uh, other forces close to India, um, uh, stopping uh, the graft in the f finances that are coming for Kashmiri development and so on. So this is really about Kashmir. But um, there is one other thing which must uh, help us understand if we want to see how deeply rooted the problem is. And that is linked, as I indicated earlier, to partition, to the partition of in, uh, United India by the British. And that is, there was a two-nation theory. And the two-nation theory was um, that if you had Muslims as a nation, Hindus would be another nation. And Muslims would be part of Pakistan, and Hindus would be part of India. Now, this two-nation theory is very deeply embedded in the, in the psyche of Pakistan. That Kashmir, because it is a Hindu state, majority state, must be part of uh, Pakistan. Likewise for India, if India, which is a uh, state which is with, with a lot of diversity, if it, if, it is, if it is to hold together, it can't give up Kashmir. So that is why you have such intransigent, intractable positions on this issue. And then this underlies everything. The notions of nationalism that India has and the notions of nationalism that Pakistan has. Now I'll switch from here to um, another part of India, largely central India. Now uh, what happened in central India was that they were a mineral rich area, a lot of timber, but no development. So, uh, from the late 1960s, there was a group of uh, radical uh, communists who called themselves Maoists, who decided to liberate the people of India from the Indian government, liberate with the gun. And that was called the first Maoist, the first Naxalite uprising after Naxalbari, the village where this started. So um, they, this, now this is not here, now this is more in central India. I'll just pull it up. Some of it is here, that is Hyderabad. So 
suffers further up in the sexual embryo. Now, um, what the Maoists said was, and now there's a difference now between the Kashmiris and the Maoists, because some of the Kashmiris had some hope of a democratic solution, participated in elections, and so forth. The Maoists had no such hopes. They said that the war has to be fought by the gun and um, uh, the Indian state has to be overthrown. And those who opposed the Maoists were class enemies who had to be executed. And um, This was uh, finally pull, pulled down, finished, in the early 70s. But they regrouped and armed again, and, uh, and are a major force now. Now, what are, what are the, their uh, advantages? One is that they work genuinely for the development of the poor. For example, if there is forest produce that the poor collect for which they are paid normally two rupees a day, the Maoists will ensure that they are paid 10 rupees or 20 rupees a day. They also set up schools in villages so that the students can have some kind of uh, schooling. They teach uh, the people to be literate. They tell them about the laws that favor them, their rights. So they're actually an empowering force. However, they're pretty ruthless. So if they suspect anyone of being linked to the state, then there will be a summary people's court and that person will be executed. Or if, as happens more commonly, if the police comes in, into a village, and tortures some uh, villager, some tribal, and forces him to speak, then after they go, the Maoists will come, they'll get information of this, and uh, they will uh, kill. Now, um, th this um, 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 kind of revolution has gathered support from the most unlikely sources, including one of India's most famous uh, novelists, Arundhati Roy, who traveled with them and moved with them through various villages and then wrote a book about it. Though it might have helped if she'd put footnotes, but so um, these two different things have some things in common. One is a problem of lack of development. It's not there. Secondly, um, the state is not really moving in to replace the Maoists with development activities. And um, whereas the Maoists are doing development, but wars are expensive, especially if you want to have your own Kalishnikov, like one uh, leader recently killed uh, had. And he told the media that that Kalishnikov cost him 100,000 rupees. So the Maoists need money for arms. 100,000 rupees is, you know, uh, about what a professor gets in some universities as a salary. So it's not exactly something you would give your son as a birthday present. So um, now these weapons are expensive. So how do the Maoists get money for these weapons? They extort from the contractors, the commercial fellers, 
the road builders and all the others who are making money. And they take about 30%, 40% of the money they're getting and uh, use it for their activities. Now, and this has caused a number of consequences. Number one, we have no idea how many people have died and how. There was, for example, a photograph in the uh, Indian press which showed two women hanging from a pole. You know, like you hang a steer like that. Of course, it led to uh, an uproar and the prime minister said this should not happen. But there was no action taken against the person who did this. And um, also, there is a brutalization on both sides. The Maoists are brutalized, the police is brutalized. And it's, it's I mean, sometimes quite crazy. For example, when I, was, I had gone for um, government uh, survey of a welfare scheme for the poor, I annoyed the police people because I said that you know, the scheme was not working well enough. And eight gunmen with assault rifles were sent to um, pay me a visit. Uh, and they really scared my students. So um, th this now shows you the contours of basically a kind of maldevelopment. Because, and I'm sure some of you will be familiar with that. Um, you're not having development. The money which is used, which is after all taxed, is uh, being used by both sides to change the contours of development by the police on the one side, uh, paramilitary police who are more well armed and trained, and by the, uh, the Maoists on the other side. So um, the whole battle now really is actually a hidden battle over what will be the path of development in India. Whether it is in the quite diverse areas of Kashmir or um, of the cent central uh, parts of India like Chhattisgarh, Charkhand, Gadicholi and such areas. This kind of path is not going to work. And nothing is sorted out by the gun. It just leads to more bitterness in alienation and despair. So I think I'll hand over to Anu now. Well, I think, um, as Kamal has told you, and you can see from the map, almost one-sixth of Indians now live in conflict zones. And this whole emerging power story is you know, being uh, reiterated by the press, media, the elite, and um, we're delighted with this, you know, and there, it is a fact that there is a rate of growth of six to eight percent, and uh, India has been a democracy. There are a lot of strengths, but there are these major internal weaknesses. Now, I think there are three primary, you know, sort of public discourses which are going on. Uh, one uh, from, one set of discourse is from these people who call themselves the liberators, whether it's the Kashmiri militants, the leaders, the separatists, the Maoists. Then in the Northeast, again, uh, there are a whole huge number of insurgencies. 28 in a small place like Manipur, there are 28 insurgent groups. The Ulfa in Assam, uh, the Naga movement in, in the Northeast. So this entire area, and uh, according to government figures themselves, 70,000 villages are not really under government control, uh, and um, large parts of the forest. Uh, so um, one-fourth of the districts are uh, um, out of control, really, are in the middle of 
some kind of civil war. Sometimes there's peace, but no real resolution. Uh, and uh, many of the people call, see these people as their leaders. So there's one, and that's one kind of discourse. The second is a state's discourse, in which a lot of people are also sympathetic to that line. And the state discourse is ma mainly to see these problems uh, through the lens of national security. That um, uh, in Kashmir, there are these Muslims who are not loyal to the Indian state, who want to break it. Uh, in the Northeast, they are mainly Christians. Uh, they have been supported at some stage, early stages by the Chinese, but no longer. And here there are these tribals. Uh, they are, um, uh, you know, they, it's a national security issue. That's one way they look at it. Second, there's also cultural representation, uh, especially of the tribals. If you go to a place like Chhattisgarh where the tribals live, outside there's a plaque which says, that such and such tribe, uh, they are sexually free. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they have these kind of cultural stereotypes. They have cultural stereotypes about the Northeast because they don't look like the North Indian Brahminical Hindu. They, you know, they have different racial features. So they, they, they're called chinkies, for example. Uh, and uh, all the people are homogenized in this national security discourse that uh, the, these are uh, basically enemies of the Indian state and the police and the army cannot distinguish between the, the militant and the non-militant. And everyone is seen, and repeatedly I've seen in the army colleges, etc. So the entire, you know, the areas where there's civil war, the entire people are seen as an enemy. That is, that is why you have so much human rights abuse and everyone is seen as a combatant. Uh, especially if the army goes in. Then the other part of this national security discourse is that they have extraordinary laws applicable uh, in these areas which are not applicable in the rest of the country. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act, the national security legislation, where the, the army has the right to uh, search and even shoot and kill if they think that someone is a militant. So they just have to assume uh, and recently we went to Manipur last week, uh, two weeks before we came here, and there were a huge number of police uh, uh, vans which had no number plate. So even if they committed an atrocity, for example, no one could complain that it was, so that, that's the kind of national security. The second discourse, that, that, so there's a cultural representation, there's a national security discourse, and the other discourse which Kamal briefly talked about is the development discourse which is not really development, it's about growth. It's a go growth story where you need uh, these huge amount of minerals and all the mining which goes on in this area, uh, which has led to huge amounts of displacement because the growth is, it's not about human development, but it's about this six to, maintaining the six to eight percent growth. And for that you need the iron ore, the steel, you need big dams, and for all that, you need that land and to, to get rid of the people on the land. So there are, even according to the, our own planning commission and official sources, millions of people who have been displaced from these areas. And uh, therefore, they, they, you know, it's very easy for the, uh, it's been easy for the Maoists to attract them on their side. So besides that, uh, so now the government is even talking about development and pouring in huge amounts of money because the government has huge amounts of money with this whole growth story. Uh, but because there are no institutions because of years of neglect, uh, this money is not uh, being able to actually be delivered in any of these areas of conflict, whether it's the Northeast, Kashmir, or Central India. Uh, and uh, the prime minister himself said that out of every rupee which has 100 pesa, only 12 pesa reaches uh, the grassroots. The rest goes in bureaucracy, etc. So that's part of the official uh, kind of um, recognition. Uh, now the other thing is, as part of this discourse, what, how it translates into policy is that the state also has 
on the one hand, they have army. On the other hand, they also have uh, milit their own militia. That is, they use people who have surrendered uh, as counterinsurgents because they're the ones who know the area. Their own army and police doesn't know the area. So uh, they get, and they have huge numbers of uh, surrendered militants in all of these areas as part of their illegal army, and they have these uh, weapons. And uh, one of these move recent movements has been called, for example, Salva Judum, which used uh, this uh, operation of uh, burning the, they thought they'll burn out the villages, where, which they thought were controlled by the Maoists, and um, uh, reclaim that area. As a result, large number of families were displaced and went further down. So uh, this is this, the second uh, part of um, uh, the insurgencies. Then, of course, there's a third discourse, and that is a liberal discourse, the human rights discourse, which, uh, which tries to bring out the, hu the huge amounts of human rights violations, the missing, uh, the um, encounters, uh, because very rarely would you, especially in the Maoist areas, would you be able to capture a Maoist alive. What the police find most convenient is uh, what they say is an encounter, that is, they catch someone and they said he was trying to run and they shoot him from the back. Uh, recently, we've had a case of uh, a woman called, uh, who was a school teacher uh, in uh, the Maoist area, Soni Sori, and uh, the police found her and of course uh, she was raped, but when she was produced in court, she alleged torture and the human rights lawyers um, actually saw that uh, there were stones put into her vagina. That was part of the torture. And they got a, it, it's been in the headlines a lot because the, the Supreme Court then ordered that there should be a, a government, uh, because the, uh, the government obviously denied it, but they said a government hospital should look into this case. And they gave the government hospital 45 days. Uh, but they still said, yes, it's true that she had these uh, so this, these, kind, these are the kind of cases which are coming up and, uh, 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 you know, one has to look at them. The other aspect, I think, which Kamal didn't touch upon is the fact that uh, a large number of women are now both combatants on both sides. The Indian Army and the police are also recruiting women hugely because... Uh, this, you know, UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which says women should be empowered, and so they're empowering it through, by putting them into the police and the army. And they're the biggest recruits for the Maoists also. Uh, so they're on both sides. And uh, there are all these uh, major gender issues, and when we've interviewed the women, they've said that even when they've been with the Maoists, on the one hand, they're empowered because they feel safer with a gun, but in the hierarchy, they're never part of the leadership. And um, they also continue to do all the domestic and other needs. And similarly, even in the Northeast, where again, um, with, there have been the Naga women who've been very important in negotiations in between the, the, the soldiers and the uh, state, etc. But when you actually um, meet them, they're never part of the leadership. Uh, as far as uh, the young men are concerned, uh, recently we did some interview. I did some interviews with uh, with boys who in in the northeast who were part of the conflict, and um, we interviewed tw 250 young boys, and 45 percent of them had said they participated, and some even said that if we have not been part of the conflict, we will be in the future, because they can't see any hope because there are barely any peace, no peace talks really going on. 87% uh, said that they were in the conflict to protect their mothers and um, sisters. 91% uh, felt that their own masculinity was challenged because there were these Indian Army soldiers. Uh, and so they were very brutal inside the home. And 43% uh, felt they felt less like a man because of the Army was there and challenged them as uh, men. and. Uh, they, they, they were incapable of protecting their home. 
and almost 95% said they were even more angry and they would take revenge someday or the other. So the, the, these, these, there, there seems to be no clear end to these conflicts and they're actually getting more and more brutalized. Um, of course, there have been some peace talks in, in some conflict areas, for example, with the uh, Naga Socialist Council. But for 17 years, the talks have been going on. There has been nobody, they're completely no, uh, non-transparent. No one knows uh, what is happening. They're often, the talks are held outside India. Uh, the, uh, the liberal groups, the human rights groups are saying that even with the Maoists, you should see them as a, as a, as a political problem and you should engage. Uh, but um, there are no takers for that kind of um, solution. Uh, even uh, with the Kashmiri leaders, the Hurriyat conference, uh, maybe once or twice uh, they have met with the leadership, but uh, they're mainly seen as, uh, you know, people are just waiting for conflict fat fatigue. There's a major issue besides development of justice, uh, where justice is not being delivered and therefore the Maoists and the local um, leaders have these kangaroo courts and try to deliver justice. So there are actually multiple conflicts going on. There's a conflict with Indian nationalism. There are structural conflicts. There's structural violence. Uh, there are domestic conflicts. Conflicts between communities for land, et cetera, are resolved because there's lawlessness. Uh, local conflicts, caste conflicts, intertribal conflicts. So they're extremely, extremely messy and um, the, uh, you know, sort of, I think the only way out really is that you have to have, you have to have political negotiations with all parties. You have to have transitional justice, which is not there. You do, you know, the, India, uh, the rest of India has uh, systems in place, but not the, these parts at all. Uh, so you need to have transitional justice you have to have a more creative constitution in which uh, you can have a new form of federalism. If, if the Kashmiris want complete independence, maybe uh, we argue that they should be given this Article 370 plus, meaning that they govern all parts, that there should be a soft border between India and Pakistan, that divided families should be able to meet, that uh, human rights issues should be addressed, uh, that, um, and of course, uh, to the militants, we uh, argue that um, research has shown repeatedly that getting um, even your political gains through violent means generally means that you will have, a, even if you get a new state, it will not really be empowering or a state based on rights and dignity. But if you have mass movements and social movements, which there are plenty of in many of these areas, then you're likely to have a, a, a better state, even if it's an independent state. So really the challenge is to, to change these violent actors into non-violent actors, to decriminalize dissent. Uh, these insurgencies are highly fractured. Very often they're also killing each other. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, therefore, there has to be, uh, you know, this kind of peaceful, uh, creative solution linked to social movements, linked to human security, linked uh, to uh, the other kind of movements which are present in India, the women's movement, the labor movement, uh, the workers' movement, they are all present, but somehow they have not been able to connect uh, with, with these areas. So, I think we end there and... Thank you so much. Um, I am opening up for questions. I think uh, people would like to ask questions. And um, I have a microphone. You mentioned that uh, a lot of uh, your theoretical research has been done on the conflict, calling it uh, conflict to uh, uh, the World Bank, etc. Uh, they've mainly argued either about the pre uh, horizontal 
social inequality or greed and grievance or resource conflict. But we don't really agree with all that because uh, if you see, it's how uh, the resources are, have actually been distributed rather than a resource curse. Uh, and horizontal inequality, there is some sense to that, especially in the, in the Maoist areas, but it's also majorly an issue of justice. The fact it's not just about inequality, it's the fact that they have not had access to justice. In Kashmir, for instance, they say we don't care about development. They've gone beyond that. They don't want, uh, of course, development matters, they say local issues do matter, but for them now it becomes very emotionally the issue of. Uh, so they no longer want to be part of the Indian state. So I think you, we need to have new theoretical paradigms also to understand how multi-dimensional these conflicts are and how many levels uh, they are and, um, uh, and their complexity. Yes. Um, so uh, that, that the greed and grievance literature, I mean, I think that most of the literature has gone beyond Collier, right, in saying that conflicts start because of greed. But what I wonder is with the long extended periods of lawlessness in these, in these places in India and Pakistan, and the kind of uneven neoliberalism, the uneven globalization that's gone on, it makes me wonder um, whether greed and grievance has something to say about why these conflicts persist and how difficult they might be to end because these kinds of informal networks and informal institutions have been built up and how likely are people going to be to trust the state to come in and provide security and provide services when the Maoists or these other groups have been providing those services for all of this time, precisely because the state wasn't doing so in the first place. You know, I think one flaw in the greed um, and grievance uh, model was that it just saw the greed and grievance of the insurgents and not of the multinational companies or the state and the uh, which comes in. Yeah, well, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the greed and grievance was that, um, you know, the political economy of conflicts is such that many of these areas where conflicts take place, uh, they are very resource rich and the insurgents start uh, gaining from this, which is also true, uh, as Kamal showed, that because they have to sustain their insurgency, a vested interest develops and some of them become very rich and so it's in their interest to keep this conflict going. But it's also in the interest of many of the army people posted there to keep this conflict going. You know, hundreds of army officers, governors of the state of Kashmir, uh, security officials who've become multimillionaires because the state has poured in money either for counterinsurgency operations uh, or for carrots like the um, uh, Americans did in Afghanistan. They tried to buy out, they said, let's buy out some of the militia and you know, give them an award for giving up their gun. But then there was the counter argument that if you're going to give them an award to give up their gun, maybe more of them will take, get the gun just to get the award. So, you know, it hasn't really worked. So th that is that, uh, and the grievance part is that people have grievances against the state and therefore they, you know, the insurgency can kind of continues. But so there, there, is, there is something to it, but it's much more complex than that. I think greed and grievance is very restricted. And of course, you know, pr after Paul Collier and there have been many other uh, theories, especially that of uh, now with globalization and increasing in inequality uh, and the state uh, not only being not able to provide security, but they're not ab able to provide even justice. They're not able to deliver. And it's, there's a dialectic 
You need security for development, but you also need development for security because you're not going to develop without security. And if you're not giving security, you're not going to get development. So, um, but I think if you, there have been success stories also. For example, Mizoram, one area in the Northeast which had an insurgency, but of course it was something of a slightly superficial insurgency in which the elite decided, the, the insurgent elite decided to have peace negotiations. And since then, they've not gone back into insurgency. But now, that area is so underdeveloped because this new elite is estranged from the grassroots that they fear that there can be a new insurgency. So I think it has to be really, you have to move towards a very human development, human rights, justice, and a very committed and a different kind of non-selfish elite to really deliver. Uh, and you need to have real structural changes. Um, I was partially because I know they're reading a book on globalization, so I want to ask this question. Um, at the end of your of your answer there, you gestured at this larger global context, and I was wondering if you could put the many different conflicts and and issues that you're talking about in that larger global context, you know, partially, and I'll just throw out a couple ideas. Um, one, we were t you were talking about a, a notion of development and resistance to development, and it seems to me that we have a lot of different ideas of what development is. The Maoist might interpret development in terms of education and bolstering up the poverty, whereas a neoliberal would not see development in those terms at all, would see it in terms of like larger financial networks. Um, so how do you see the kind of larger context of the United States and financial markets playing a role in the conflicts that you're talking about, especially in, the, in, the, especially in terms of the concept of development, which is such a ambiguous and contested term? Um, and also, alongside of that, the role of civil society, which tends to be globalized, since your solution seems to be um, a, civil, a development of civil society, which neither the Maoists nor the neoliberals are interested in. Um, <laughs> and that's that's your third. That's the kind of third space. But civil society is very a very troubled um, space, which has trouble building alliances without without support from, I don't know, money donations from other countries. So that's, I guess that's my, that's my question. Actually, you know, if you see the, uh, the uh, Maoist movement as Kamal showed, that first it came in the 19, by 1967 and it was crushed completely. It was over and everyone thought that's the end of these Maoists and it's a dead idea, it's a dead ideology. And suddenly you have two phenomena coming parallel. One is India becoming globalized and second the Maoists rising again. So they're almost in, in conjunction and in parallel developments, which goes to show that the deep and the, and the Indian growth story is highly uneven and combined. Uh, the, and um, what civil society says is that the upper classes have seceded from the people. They're not interested in, in that kind of development, they're interested in growth. Because they, there are some who have benefited very greatly from this globalization with the BPOs, with it, the new industrialization as the West has deindustrialized, especially Europe and uh, all the manufacturing has gone to India and China and new centers. But, and th these are all in, in, other, in other parts. And in, in this area, Chhattisgarh, POSCO, uh, the Narmada project of huge dams, all these are coming up which are leading to displacement and they're the typical neoliberal projects uh, linked, uh, for example, POSCO, the Korean project. Uh, this project, I'll just give you an example and you'll get to know what it is meant. It is because this area has uh, a huge amount of iron ore. Uh, and the Indian government has had a memorandum of understanding with POSCO, which is a huge uh, South Korean company.
But instead of, for example, they could have given them, let's say, a thousand acres where uh, they can do the mining. But instead, they've given them 10,000 acres and a captive fort. So that whole area has, uh, it's, it's a huge area where now uh, the land has been taken from the tribals who had their own system of common property. Uh, their uh, places of local worship have been demolished. Uh, they resisted because for them, uh, land was most important. They were not made stakeholders in this project. Uh, the forest have to be cleared. Uh, the environment ministry first opposed it because it meant thousands of hundreds of thousands of trees and ponds and that, you know, that old civilization going. But the um, government, the other ministries, the finance ministry, which is very close to the World Bank and to the financial institutions, they put pressure on the environment ministry to give clearance. Uh, so even government ministries are having different reports on what is happening. And there's this hurry to develop, and this development is all about growth. And the others, and the civil society is arguing that we don't want this kind of growth. Yes, we want development, but we want a development which, in which people are stakeholders, in which there can't be this kind of displacement, there has to be livelihood. Um, so that debate goes on. Uh, but uh, civil society is pretty, it's, it's strong, but it's, fractionalized, they have, each of the NGOs has one issue. Uh, so uh, they are pretty donor driven, uh, but, and anytime they come into conflict with the government, if they dissent, then the government points out and says that after all they're getting foreign money. So, but actually it's the government which is getting the most foreign money. I mean, this is very rich coming from a government which is, which has opened up so much that, um, uh, <laughs> it's totally integrated with international finance. It's uh, the, and the, it's become the greatest arms importer, and all the arms, even unlike China, are imported from Russia and Israel. And uh, recently, they've got 126 a uh, Rafale aircraft, which and the nuclear program. Again, that's of great contention, and the contention that is in civil nuclear plants and they signed this agreement, the Indo-US strategic agreement for civil nuclear energy. Uh, and uh, these nuclear plants are being built and there were people's movements, again, because they needed the land for that. And uh, led by some NGOs. And now uh, the, uh, you know, the government is saying that we need these nuclear plants because we are energy starved. India is a country without its own energy resources. We need nuclear energy which costs billions of dollars and there's billions of dollars of investments and for that we again need to clear the space. So it's kind of a vicious cycle which is going on, but I don't know if you want to add to that. No, I just want to mention about globalization. Um, earlier, there was the entire uh, differentiation between growth and development in the 60s. That discourse has vanished. But if you want to look at the impact of globalization, one official um, st survey has shown that 77% of India's population live on 50 cents and less a day. So what kind of globalization is that? And that is precisely why you have all these struggles. It's not the only reason, but it is one reason. Because if people are starving, they'll do something about it. Um, this was a debate um, uh, in the 60s where even people who were not economists like Johann Galtung and others took, uh, took part, but also um, a number of economists, 
especially from southern uh, America. And uh, the argument was that if you have growth, the growth must not be uneven. Because if it is uneven, only some people benefit. Others don't benefit. So you can't really call it development because it, is, it isn't development. Mm. And in fact, that is why there was, a, at that time, Andre, Andre Gunder Frank wrote a book called Development of Underdevelopment. Yeah, I just want to add, um, one thing is, um, you know, the easiest thing to distinguish uh, growth and development, growth is just measured in terms of a country's GDP. Like India is growing at six to eight percent, so great, that means that that's growth. But development, we would argue, should be measured in terms of uh, literacy, maternal mortality, which remains high, uh, child mortality, which is the highest in India, comparable to Su Sudan and Somalia, almost the same percentage. Um, doctor to person ratio as compared to policeman to person ratio, which is very, it's in Kashmir, for example, for every eight people, there's one policeman. But there are only five psychologists in a conflict area where everyone is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. There are no, there are no psych, uh, psychiatrists. So we argue that if you want to measure, Kashmir is growing, you know, it's exporting. But the human development indicators are abysmal. Uh, so that's the difference between growth and development. And all the neoliberal economists of India, and they're producing fantastic neoliberal economists who are being exported all over the world, by the way. They dominate the economic departments world over, the Indian economists, because they're very good in maths. Yes, ev <laughs> every, everywhere. Jagdish Bhagwati. Um, <laughs> yes. So. Um, uh, but the other, uh, the, the, those who are arguing for human development and for these other kind of sustainable development, they are marginalized because they're not getting the jobs in the universities and the uh, MBA institutes, etc. because they're saying that focus on this. But of course, there is a populist position. Because India is a democracy and they have to win elections, sometimes you get some great um, acts also. For example, there was this... National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. It was one of the first countries in all of Asia to actually ensure that the rural air people, you know, they got 100 days of work uh, for minimum on minimum wages. And I think Kamal was very active in that campaign and went from village to village um, campaigning for this. Then uh, recently, after that, they got the Right to Information Act which has really troubled the government, and that is how we've been able to write all the human rights reports, because you can ask a question. So there are some fantastic acts of universal social security which we are struggling for. So what I'm arguing is that in India, there are these violent movements, and there are a huge number of non-violent progressive movements which are also seeking change. And therefore, our whole aim is to make these violent actors into non-violent dissenters and decriminalize dissent so that, uh, uh, so there are these, you know, there, there are these windows of opportunity. And the second point which I think I want to make is the fact that the tribals who are now part of this Maoist movement, they have a different agenda. Uh, the Maoist agenda is to capture state power. The tribal agenda is not that. The tribal agenda is for livelihoods and for their existence and uh, some amount of uh, uh, development. But the Maoists have taken over this agenda. So I think if the state became sensitive, they can get the people back. If, be if it became a developmental state, which we, we, and uh, that's what we want, a more humane state, rather than a state which just sees everything in terms of national security, because it's a strong enough state. that we may have to leave, but one a uh, couple of things. Uh, you probably heard tribal and didn't know what that was. 
we have indigenous populations in India, not, and that's what the tribal refers to. And they, just like in the United States, uh, they, are, they were kept in protected areas. And of course, with globalization, they discovered that those areas have mines and forests. And so now they want to take away their land. And they're not giving them just compensation. So of course, then they're angry and they're taking up arms to resist. So does that make sense? Do you let can I ask let her ask a question? Yeah, yeah, they're they're really they're not Native Americans. Yeah, they are similar. I mean Devon. Very similar, very similar, absolutely. As in if Al Kashmir is um, the majority of Kashmir is uh, Muslim. So isn't it natural that it belongs to Pakistan in the first place? So no. why is that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just, I just because you skipped the part of the history a little bit, but I, uh, I'm glad you asked it. Yeah. See, um, the Indian national movement never accepted the two nation theory that because the people have one religion, they should be part of another country. In fact, the partition of India was marked by extreme sectarian hatred, and about uh, one million people died. So um, there, are, uh, there, uh, there are a number of places in India where you have a large Muslim population. Uh, and cumulatively, Muslims are around 14% plus of the population. Is there so a second last country with such large Muslim population? Next to Indonesia, India is the second largest Muslim uh, dominant country. One is how you involve people within the state to, to solve these problems. Um, a lot of these problems are caused by elite conflicts. The conflict between Pakistan and India serves elite interests. Particularly, uh, uh, yeah, it's not serving my interests. But especially on the Pakistani side, it serves the Pakistani elite interests for the state identity of Pakistan to have this conflict, and the military for sure. It justifies all kinds of things. So how do you involve um, people in the movement to actually make change, to, get, to break that? And the same thing goes with, okay. The same thing goes with the, these Maoist insurgencies and other insurgencies is, this, is the lack of coordination and a lack of dialogue between the state and these people. It's, it's the elite interests that are being served. So why development is rapidly changing India and you can go to Delhi and Delhi is so different over the past. 20 years, right? And it's not just because it's grown huge into a me megatropolis, but it's just so different. But, but it still does not have the same impact for the person who is wealthy and can go to elite places and then go on to the West, as opposed to someone who uh, grows up dirt poor, who lives on what you were saying, 50 cents a day. How do you interact with those people? How do you get those people into the political dialogue? And, and a lot of politicians are good at manipulating people, of course, to get them to vote, whether it's about food or it's about some other nationalist cause, then that's what serves interest. So how do you, how do you, exactly, the Maoists are quite good at doing it, but how do you interact with people in another way without a violent way? And that's the question. I mean, I know there are nonviolent movements, but the problem with both India and Pakistan and Bangladesh is that they went from being colonial states where the British elite controlled and made decisions to where the Indian elite and the Pakistan elite and the Bangladesh elite do the same exact thing. They follow a colonial model. And that's what the real root of these problems are. How do you break that? It's not an easy answer. <laughs> I think the, uh, yeah. Well, I think what one way is really to have a lot of, you know, to get these people into what, to ensure their livelihood. For example, uh, 
uh, on all the radical economists and all the social movements together, they've been arguing, for example, recently for a Food Security Act, that everyone must have a right to food. And they went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yes, people should have a right to food because right to life is in our constitution. So they ordered the government on a series of steps moving towards a right to food. The first was midday meal scheme in all government schools, which has actually, which all the radical economists and uh, others in civil societies said that kids were going to school hungry and they couldn't concentrate and they'd come back not learning because they hadn't eaten. And once they got this midday scheme now is part of law. And you're turning out better students now. And more people are coming to school. And child labor has decreased with parents putting their own children to work for food. Now they send them to school. So you have to have this kind of creative legislation and make sure it's implemented well. The National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. We argued that it should not just be a Rural Employment Guarantee Act, but, but it should be universal. We argued for a public distribution system, which was there in the 1960s, where you had rations. And anyone could have a ration card and get grain and basic things that they eat, like rice and grain at least, and oil, right. at two rupees a kilo. But with neoliberal globalization, that was dismantled because the state had to withdraw from subsidies. And it was, you know, this whole state sector was so... These are the two sides of the, the, this is exactly the question which is being, this, this is the debate, that you can get rid of these issues and become a developmental state by having legislation in which a state like India cannot withdraw from benefits. It has to be a welfare state, whereas globalization everywhere means that you don't have this, what you call a nanny state, and don't look after this womb from tomb. These are the words being used. Uh, so you don't have, but they, they, they're being forced to follow. But they all, the elite wants to follow it also. They, they think that's the only, but yeah. So, and it's not, but it sounds, in a way, that what you're suggesting that happens is that a co-optation of the Maoist practices gets gets taken by less militant organizations. So, mil organizations that are less militant basically do what the Maoists are already doing, but do it in a, in a less militant way. Uh, so the Maoists are doing both things. They do this development, but they also are very authoritarian, oppressive, and they appropriate the power of the people, and they, they think they represent the people, and they don't. So whoever this is, they, they have their own authoritarian structure, their own patriarchal system, and very often they come from other areas. And in, uh, in response to this kind of uh, criticism, they have developed local leaders. And you see a lot of systems uh, according to these areas. For example, elections still go on in this area. How? Because even the main Extreme politicians, they're in league with the Maoists when it comes to getting votes. They work with the Maoists at that time and then uh, locally, because otherwise they can't go into these areas. So, and, the, and the local industrialists are in league with the Maoists. Otherwise, how are these companies working? And people, <laughs> you know, the, the major big industrialists of India, some of these companies, their local guy has been caught bribing the Maoist. So the Maoists also allow them to work there and extract as long as they get a part of the, the taxes. And the same in the Northeast, it's official. All the rebel groups and everyone pay, pays some tax to the rebel groups. So they, there's also a discrediting of the Maoists. And it's not difficult to get people back because the, that is why we call them degenerated insurgencies because they're so repressive, they're not democratic, they're illegal in every way, but they live amongst people, and but the counterinsurgency is also illegal. And in fact, the British who were great at fighting counterinsurgencies, and they wrote all these books on Malaysia and how to fight the communists, etc. They have argued that the best way to, at least some of these theorists have said, the best way to fight a, have a counterinsurgency is do it legally. 
but nobody's learned that. But then if you do fight a counterinsurgency legally and with development, it's much easier to get peace back. But that's not happening in all these, including in Philippines and Afghanistan and all these. I think we should end now. Thank you so much. Again, join me in thanking them.